Right, time to move on. And one thing we're homing in on is the fantastic imagination of Johannes Kepler. But we, we'll need a little while to get there. And we have a, a little game to do now with um, geometry. Geometry, remember, is space without time. It is therefore an ideal. And as played in the Greek fashion with the straight line and compass, um, there are certain associations that necessarily arise. So if we contemplate this figure, which we did before, the circle, the square, and the line, let's consider them in turn, and we allow ourselves a little poetry maybe. The circle is here representing the infinite, inexhaustible, perfected form. Whereas the square, which is made of countable units, it's, it's kind of from multiplicity. It is uh, inside the circle and it touches the circle only at the ends of its edges. And the red line there belongs to both the circle and the square and makes it clear that what is a, uh, the points of contact um, of the square, the fallen, the innumerable, and the circle, the perfect, that they actually coincide, they meet at these two points. And you could inscribe very many uh, shapes inside the circle, and you could do this slightly differently. You could um, inscribe the square around the circle. I suppose you could do that too, couldn't you? Because Greeks like doing lots of things. And then you find that the red line, which belongs to both of them, now it doesn't touch a corner of the square, but it touches the middle of an edge. And that's going to be useful in what follows, because what we're going to do now, you see, is we're going to try and pop from 2D to 3D. But those words 2D, 3D, they're meaning something different in this discussion than they normally mean in our image-saturated um, way of talking. It's difficult to appreciate the real difference between two-dimensional representation and volumetric space. All of our thinking tends to be planar. We tend to collapse things to two dimensions. We saw Mr. Descartes doing so to great effect with his coordinate system. And when we pop to three dimensions, and if we want to play this game, then our circle becomes a sphere. Well, that's wonderful. And our square, well, it could become a cube, but it turns out there's other ways to pop from two to three dimensions. This is the wonderful, giddy world of platonic solids. As we move from two dimensions to three dimensions, the game we just played changes, and there are actually five regular polyhedrons that we can use instead of the uh, where the square was with respect to the circle. These are the, the five of them. There's the tetrahedron, the cube, octahedron, and the ones with the long names. The dodecahedron and icosahedron, and I always get them confused. Um, they're very familiar uh, to many people because these are just the kind of thing that gamers play with. They're in every game set of dice around here now. And um, I, I made some. I made me some platonic solids. I baked them myself. There's the tetrahedron, a beautiful little yoke. And there's my cube, which has got sat on more than once. And my octahedron, which won't stand up. And my icosahedron, which is getting raggedy. And my uh, dodecahedron. And I might have got those two mixed up. I always get them mixed up. But it doesn't matter. We're not talking about them. We're going to talk mainly about these two, the octahedron and the cube. Um, they are what's called duels. What does that mean? Well, remember the game we were just playing with circles and squares. If we do it now with spheres and these guys, if we contract a sphere around this guy until it just barely touches it, it's going to touch the cube at the eight vertices. And if we contract a sphere around this guy, it's going to touch the octahedron at the six vertices. But if we secretly take a sphere and put it inside the cube and blow it up, until it's maximal, it's going to touch the cube at the faces, all eight faces, and what, one, two, three, four, five, six faces. And if we do the same thing here, we blow up the sphere inside here, we get eight faces. So six vertices, eight faces, 
eight vertices, six faces. These are duals of each other. These are also duals of each other, but I'm not capable of doing that here. So I want to think with these two because I said geometry is more fun when you have a body. And we're used to thinking abstractly about geometry, but I like to think about geometry with these things actually in, in place. And here they are in place. This is my appallingly filthy hallway. Oh my God, it belongs to the land of the fallen and multiplicity. And there's the cube and the octahedron um, sitting in it. And I want to think about space, first of all, with the cube, because it's our conventional way of thinking about space. You are very probably inside a boxy kind of room right now. If you, I, I assume, I can't tell because I'm, I'm in my room, you're in your room, but there's probably a horizontal floor where you are and probably a horizontal ceiling where you are. And I'd be surprised if there wasn't even four vertical walls around you. It's a very common kind of living environment for a modern person. We're in rooms an awful lot and they greatly shape our imagination. And we do tend to think of space by default in this box-like manner. So you can imagine yourself sitting in a room or you could actually sit in a room. And when you sit in a room, you can look up, you can look down and you can look at all in all four directions. That's really interesting. You look up to the ceiling, you look down to the floor and you look in all four directions at the walls. And here's a person sitting in a room. This was generated by AI, which I don't really like. And I think you get that the idea of how the cube is related to space. You can understand where the faces are and where the, the walls and where the corners are. But this little guy, the octahedron, is very interesting as well because we can see that the cube in my hallway is correctly aligned, right? At the top of the cube is parallel to the ceiling, the bottom of the cube is parallel to the four, and the four walls are arranged, four sides are arranged so that they point at the four walls, as it were. The octahedron here is also correctly positioned in my hallway. It's correctly positioned because the vertical and the up-down dimension is, is correctly aligned, and the four directions are given here as vertices, where we had four walls on a room, we now have four directions to point here. So this is also, being the dual of the cube, it is also a way of thinking about space, but it's not the boxy kind of way we're used to thinking about space. So to show you this, I want to turn to a different model. I want to draw from the Sufis. Um, Sufism is a venerable tradition, largely within Islam, um, and Sufi worship is magnificent. Sufi chanting is, the, is, is, is an absolute dream. Um, and one of the many elaborated forms of Sufism is found, for example, in Turkey, where uh, the whirling dervishes are well known. And so I'm just going to play you a little video clip, I hope YouTube don't get me for copyright on this, of some beautiful whirling dervishes. And then we'll, 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 we'll talk about what we learned from that. So, um, I've taken the license of using an AI-generated image again because I don't want to deface any real picture of real dervishes. So this is a, a nonsensical image, but it does illustrate the six directions uh, in which space is manifest to an embodied being. The vertical, up, down. Remember we looked at which way was up last video. And the four that have to do with the horizontal nature of space for beings who are columnar, cephalic, and forward-facing, there is this incredibly important horizontality to space, which we never speak about much. And it becomes quite evident when we think, think octahedrally rather than cubically. Now, it's very easy to understand the relation of the cube to space by sitting in a room. The octahedron, well, we're not all whirling dervishes, but I suggest that it's very easy to understand the octahedral approach to space as well. You simply face something rather than be contained by it. 
For example, this person here is facing space. And you can stand in one and the same spot and you can understand yourself as contained and you can understand yourself as projecting, as it were, as facing and encountering. Now, thinking around cubes and thinking around octahedrons in space is great fun. It embodies you, it makes you aware of characteristics of space. But I would advise against attaching any single interpretive mode to either the cube or the octahedron. If at one stage you're thinking cubically and you're thinking, oh, I'm in a box, I'm in a box, the walls are closing in, <gasps> I'm in an octahedron, I can point in all directions. Well, in a, in a, two seconds later, they may flip and you may be thinking, um, the octahedron is one thing and the cube is another. I can't say what's going to go on in your mind if you play with these things. But if you play with geometry in three-dimensional volumetric space, you understand things you could never understand from a blackboard or a whiteboard. So that's kind of fun. And I think it's necessary if we're going to understand what Kepler did. Because I mentioned in the last video that you have an internal model of outer space, including the solar system. Kepler was rather good at this, and he thought volumetrically using these guys rather than just squares and circles. So we'll try and get to him. All right, there's even more to do, isn't there?